In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask you pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The context of this passage is Matthew 16, 16, the famous episode in Caesarea Philippi. When our Lord had asked the apostles who the people thought he was, and they said all kinds of things, John the Baptist, or one of the prophets, but then he asked them, who, you, who do you think that I am? Our Lord always asks for our personal commitment, not the collectivity. We don't go to heaven in groups. We go to heaven individually, even if many people go to heaven. Sanctity, a statical struggle, St. Cosa Maria used to say, is very personal, person, personalissimo he would say in Spanish, chopping up the words for emphasis or the syllables for emphasis. But soon after that episode, or is, I suppose it's still within that episode, after Peter had confessed his um, belief in the divinity of our Lord and been granted <clears throat> the primacy you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I shall give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter, the successor, the Pope, holder of the keys of the kingdom. But immediately afterwards is this passage where our Lord starts telling them that he must suffer and die. Something which, was, which we are right now reliving as we approach Holy Week. And Peter took him up, up, apart, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter, always the spontaneous one. Peter, who always speaks out his mind and what's in his heart. And in his heart, he couldn't bear the thought of our Lord leaving them. He loved Jesus. And yet our Lord turns around and rebukes him in the most or shall we say in the strongest terms, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Get behind me, Satan. You are a scandal in my path. In Greek, the word scandalum comes from the verb scandalain, which means to trip. You know, when you, when you put your foot to trip someone, that's what a scandal is something that trips up a person. And here our Lord is teaching us a very important lesson. Because in that, shall we say, um, effort or attempt of Peter to talk him out of his sacrifice is enshrined the biggest obstacle to the action of grace in our soul, which is self-love. This egoistic self-defense mechanism that shuns whatever smacks of suffering or discomfort or any change from our comfort zone. But our Lord tells them at that moment, for whoever would save his life, or rather if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Because in fact, in order for the work of the Holy Spirit to progress, we cannot put obstacles 
to his hewing and filing and perhaps even cutting off portions of what the, that persona that we have made for ourselves so that the image of Jesus Christ comes out. That's really what happens in a ascetical struggle. We become Christ, we get transformed to Christ, not by the Holy Spirit just doing it. We have to do it. We have to conform ourselves. And therein lies the rub, the proverbial rub, because many times we don't, we don't feel like it. Because precisely, we're afraid of the cross. We're afraid of suffering. Years ago, I saw a, a uh, student in one of our study centers with a book that was entitled, Why Suffer? This was in the 1980s. I never got to open that book because it was stuck under her arm in the first place. And it was a class on Christian doctrine that she was attending. But the, the, the title stuck to my mind. Why suffer? Because that's a mystery that philosophers and the spiritual writers had tackled through the ages and had come up with all kinds of reasons. The pagans explained it in terms of the effect of terrestrial bodies. That's why you have feng shui or you have the horoscope. The polyatheists, on the other hand, would think of it as the game of the gods. Remember that line of the, the song of the Nibelungs, the Nibelungans lead of Northern European folklore whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. You know, they were the tragic victims of the game of the gods. Buddhism would speak of the sevenfold path to happiness after having stated that unhappiness, sorrow, is the consequence of unmet needs or unmet desires or unrealized desires or dreams. So therefore, its sevenfold path to happiness is a question of seven steps towards nihilism. I'm not wanting anything. Well, I always say, if you want the happiness of a rock, or if you think that a rock is happy, then good luck to you. Christianity erupts into history with an entirely new idea of suffering, an endowment's best that great document of the Second Vatican Council, number 22, we read, through Christ and in Christ, the riddles of sorrow and death grow meaningful. Apart from the gospel, they overwhelm us. We have to look at Christ to penetrate it, the meaning of the cross. We have to contemplate his passion and death to learn the meaning of pain and renunciation. That's why this retreat is very good, because we're there in the portals of Holy Week. Why suffer? Well, in the first place, in the purely natural plane, <clears throat> because human freedom is defectible. And so therefore, human beings have been causing pain to each other since the dawn of human history or human, uh, of humanity. Men have introduced, we have introduced this order in an otherwise orderly and so therefore a pleasurable paradise. Remember, we read that in Genesis, God made a garden of pleasure. If things were in the right places, there should be no pain and no suffering. Pain and suffering, the consequence of original sin, of the disorder wrought by men, men in the environment and on their fellow men in the process. That's the first reason for suffering in the natural plane. And still in the natural plane, in order to restore order or to at least put a semblance of it, requires effort, requires abnegation, requires sacrifice. There you have suffering again. <laughs> Just to stay fit, for example. They have a saying, no, no pain, no gain. Of course, that's not true. I mean, a real athlete who knows what he's doing should not be in pain unless he gets into an injury. 
but uh, you shouldn't be injuring yourself if you do it properly. But the fact is, in order to do good, there's what somebody else called the sweat factor, hard work. And there again, it's a cause of suffering. But the most co convincing reasons are in the supernatural plane. Because God wants us to be saints. That the goal of our life is to attain union with God. And for that, really, you, you realize, in order for that to happen, we have to be totally available, malleable, to the action of the Holy Spirit. Grace works on nature, but the infra-nature, the fallen nature that we have, is a resistance to the work of grace. So we have to tear that down, cut it down to size, so to speak, and that causes suffering. But you know what the greatest reason for suffering really is? Not just reason, but I would even say rational justification is identification with Christ. How can we embrace our Lord? How can we embrace you, my Lord? How can we accompany you if we're afraid of the cross? Because you are on that cross. Many years ago, I heard of an anecdote of a lady who was praying in one of the side chapels of a church. It happened here in the Philippines. And in that little chapel was a, a crucifix, life-size, which was at ground level. It was precisely on the floor, I think, mounted on the floor. And so the lady was there kneeling, praying, doing her devotions. But beside her was a thud, I mean, a six-year-old boy, typical Dennis the Menace type, who was there getting restless. And in a given moment, the boy went to the cross and embraced our Lord at the feet, the legs, rather, because, you know, he was small. <clears throat> it was a hug. He hugged our Lord. Okay, the woman was startled but uh, kept her peace. But when they got out, she asked the boy, her son, why did you do that? And you know what the boy said? Because he had his arms open. That that innocent little boy must have recognized the gesture of an embrace. Well, that's the greatest rationalization for suffering. <clears throat> that our Lord on the cross is not attached to the wood with nails. That's in the physical level. At the spiritual level, what led him to the cross and what made him stay there for three hours was that openness to mankind. It's the father of the prodigal son. It's his gesture to the good thief. It's God the Father welcoming his children back. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Oh, my Lord, how can we not embrace the cross if you're on it? Simon of Cyrene, we read in the gospel, was forced to help carry the cross to Calvary. I always take have taken note of that. He was forced. In other words, he didn't volunteer. If somebody volunteers, you don't force him. We're like that. Many times we don't volunteer. We don't volunteer to work. We don't volunteer to make the necessary adjustments. We don't volunteer to be mortified, to deny ourselves. But the circumstances on time to effectively make us deny ourselves or suffer something were forced. Simon of Cyrene, by being forced, started carrying that cross and something happened. Something happened that years later would reap their rewards. Because if you pay attention to the account of the evangelists, the evangelist said, uh, when talking of uh, Simon of Cyrene, 
It says Hamid al-Sirini, the father of Alexander and Rufus. In other words, the point of reference of the evangelist was Alexander and Rufus, the sons of Simon of Cyrene. Why? Because by that time, they were well known in the Christian community. So when the evangelist wrote his account, he would refer to Simon of Cyrene as the father of Alexander and Rufus, who we know very well. They were already, shall we say, uh, outstanding members of the Christian community. And St. Cosa Maria in Via Crucis, in the Way of the Cross, would comment. And it all started with that chance meeting with the cross. Not chance, rather, that unexpected, because it was not chance, not on the part of God, unexpected on the part of Simon of Cyrene. This is what happens to us, my brothers. Our Lord loves us so much. He knows where the shoe hurts, what we need to give up, what we need to adjust. And so he contrives situations for us to do just that. Or, better still, he enlightens us in our prayer. And we ourselves have to cut it off. We ourselves have to shave off those extra pounded, so to speak. The following of Christ entails recognizing the cross and embracing it. That's why uh, Pope Saint John Paul II, speaking once to the students of the University of the Holy Cross, our the University of Opus Dei in Rome, which are composed of ecclesiastical faculties, would say that would rather refer to the wisdom of the cross. But our founder, St. Cosa Maria, would go a step further even and speaks of the science of the cross. Remember that wisdom is the virtue that inclines a person to evaluate temporal realities in their connection, in their worth to our ultimate end. Whatever helps towards the ultimate end is valued and whatever doesn't is disvalued, even disregarded. That's the wise person who sees everything as a function of going to the last end of heaven. But science, science is defined as the certain knowledge through causes. You know, when you know something because of its causality, what are the things that went into it? What's its design? What's its purpose? How it was made? That's what you call science. So to speak of the science of the cross actually refers to that capacity of an individual not only to evaluate temporal realities in their connection to the last end, but rather even to understand how they will work for the last end. How every good has a causality which entails sacrifice, which entails work, which entails the cross. So the science of the cross refers to that capacity of an individual to recognize the redemptive value of everything that happens to him. Nothing is by chance. And that's the reason why St. Paul would later on say that for those who love God, all things work together unto good. First, the condition, those who love God, those who want to go to heaven, those who want to be identified with Jesus Christ, then everything works together unto good. He says that everything is for the good. No, it works. Meaning to say, we have to work at it. We have to make use of that reality, of those realities. We have to recognize the redemptive value of that sacrifice, of that effort. Can you imagine what a powerful thing this is? It means that a person who is in the right framework the right mindset, a person who is in the presence of God, nothing is wasted. Everything works together for the good. 
just like Chinese friend of mine who looks at anything and immediately thinks, Pano bang pagkakakwarta ito? No? What's the profit in this? Where's the business angle here? I, I know someone who, when the uh, pandemic struck last year, in March, right? Or the lockdown, rather, found himself in crisis because his business relied on food traffic, relied on people who drive in, who drive through. And all of a sudden, everything was in the lockdown. But since he's a real entrepreneur, he's a real salesman, he, sh he soon got into the internet and before long was making money, relatively a good sum, sourcing PPPs and all these things that had to be used for fighting the pandemic. The law of supply and demand, the law of supply chain also. He made use of what would have been a, a disaster. He made use of a disaster, as a matter of fact, in order to do something. Work for his family to retain his employees, to give them economic activity, to put food on the table. That's the spirit of sacrifice. That's the science of the cross. For all too long, people have fallen into the misconception that Christianity is a religion for losers, like Consuelo de Bobo, for suffering or for whatever. No, it's not, because it takes a lot of fortitude, a lot of wisdom and science and fortitude to make things work. That when the world, as the, the saying goes, when the world gives you lemons, make lemonade, to which I would even add, and don't be content with lemonade. Lemonade is cheap. Elaborate it a bit more and make marmalade. Elaborate it a bit more, add ginger to it and make fantastic gourmet marmalade. That's what the Lions of the Cross is. You see why, how Christianity and the Cross is not a religion for, for pushovers or for ninnies. It requires a lot of fortitude, a lot of wisdom, a lot of science, a lot of oomph, as they would say, to struggle this way, not out of pride. This is not a self-affirmation kind of thing. Rather an affirmation of the love of God who wants us to go to heaven, who crafted us from eternity with that finality and has amply provisioned that route if only we recognize the signs of the times. And that's the reason why for the believer for the prayerful person, the cross cannot be something that you just kind of resign yourself to. And though Christianity, the ascetical struggle becomes a, a grim process. As somebody once says, team bagang na nagpapakabanal. No? I mean, you know. No, no, no. The ascetical struggle, Christianity, is a path of joy. I remember an interview that was granted by the past prelate of Opus Dei, Bishop um, Javier Echevarria, soon after the canonization of our founder. And um, the journalist or the reporter asked him, how was life like with the saint, referring to Saint Cosa Maria? And you know what Don Javier, Bishop Javier, said in reply? Nos pasamos bomba. That's a very Castilian construction. It means we had a grand time. Not that they were engaged in, I don't know what, celebrations, bacchanalian feasts and things like that. God knows the kind of life that they had to struggle through, to slog through. Not only to survive, but to do apostolate and to expand the apostolic activities of Opus Dei at the time when precisely everything else was dwindling. Seminaries were closing, convents were closing, I don't know. But obviously it was growing robustly. They were having a grand time. Why? 
Because when a person is in love, sacrifice is joyful. You're all fathers and husbands. You know how it is. When you were younger and you had to get up in the morning to go to work, face that traffic. You didn't do it grudgingly. With a song in your heart, as you kiss your young wife goodbye, and you kiss your, perhaps even your sleeping children, still, joyfully you went out to battle. Why? Because you were doing it for a good cause. That is the cross in our life. But when push becomes shout, the going really gets rough. And there will be days like that. There will be occasions like that when really life is not only giving us lemons, but they're really giving us, I don't know what, chilies <laughs> or whatever unpleasant taste you, you can imagine. Of course, for those who you like chili, that's not unpleasant at all. And just like our Lord going up Calvary, we find solace in the presence of our Blessed Mother, who will always be there. And I've always been struck with the fact that those who were faithful at the foot of the cross were Our Lady, St. John, the St. John who was the youngest apostle and adolescent at that time, and the holy women, some holy women. You know, Calvary, during an execution, it's a terrible thing. Women don't normally go to those things. The apostles, first while stalwart men who had uh, pledged that they were ready to die for our Lord, they were all gone. You know? They scattered. I suppose those holy women and even St. John they initially thought they were keeping Our Lady company to be with her son. As you know very well, it, still, it was the other way around. It was Our Lady who strengthened them so that they could be at the foot of the cross. But that's the same thing that would happen to us. When going gets rough and we really want to drag off that cross, we want to stop this ascent of Calvary, never mind along. You know? Then we go back to our comfort zone. No. Let's go with our Blessed Mother. Let's go to our Blessed Mother. Let's cling to his arm, her arms, rather, her hand. And if that's not enough, then let's also go to St. Joseph. Get him into the picture, too. Because he's our Father and Lord, especially this year, is dedicated to him. Let's get to know him very well. And with this, too, we can face any cross. We can face any sacrifice. We'll be willing to do what is necessary in order to second the action of the Holy Spirit. And that's the way we're going to be saints. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you how to put them to effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. <laughs>